this unification, we can experience pure joy or true love. Um, from one of my favorite books on Crowley, uh, Delege Labellum, he says, It is written that love is the law, love under will. Herein is an arcanum concealed, for in the Greek language, agape, love, is the same numerical value as thelema, which is will. But this we understand that the universal will is of the nature of love. Now, love is the enkindling and ecstasy of two that will to become one. It is thus a universal formula of high magic. For see now how all things being in sorrow caused by individuality must of necessity will oneness as their medicine. Understand now that in yourselves is a certain discontent. Analyze well its nature. At the end is in every case one conclusion. The ill springs from the belief in two things, the self and the not-self, and the conflict between them. This also is a restriction of the will. He who is sick, to, sick is in conflict with his body. He who is poor is at odds with his society. And so for the rest. Ultimately, therefore, the problem is how to destroy this perception of duality, to attain the apprehension of unity. Now, the great work in itself, as I personally see it, is that exactly that. It's a search for you, however you may see that in all aspects of your life. Union with the divine, like I say, union between conflicting parts of yourself or conflicting parts of your personality, maybe. Uh, this is usually achieved with what we, th we refer to as the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian. In Magic and Theory and Practice, one of the greatest books on magic ever written, there is a single main definition of the object of all magical ritual. It is the uniting of the microcosm with the macrocosm. The supreme and complete ritual is therefore the invocation of the Holy Guardian Angel, or in the language of mysticism, the union with God. All other magical rituals are particular cases of this general principle. Now, probably thinking I'm crazy talking about angels, but the HGA, or the Holy Guardian Angel, is simply a term of convenience that comes to us from the Golden Dawn. Um, it's not necessarily a literal angel as such, though some may perceive it that way. Um, I think most see it as a manifestation of our innermost selves, or of our higher consciousness, or at least a gateway to our higher consciousness. It's sort of the door between us and, if you, if you understand the tree of life, sort of us and the supernal higher spheres. Um, again, these things are hard to define, and they're unique to each individual, so we have to give them names and symbols. And the Holy Guardian Angel is simply a term that we use so that we all know what the hell we're talking about, basically. To quote from Aleister Crowley's Liber Semek, the angel is in truth the logos, or articulate expression of the whole being of the adept. So that as he increases in his perfect understanding of his name, he approaches the solution of the ultimate problem, who he himself truly is. The angel is the spiritual sum of the soul of the adept. The angel is the true self of his subconscious self. It is the hidden life of his physical life. And so it is hoped, through a life committed to the great work uh, and the study of various mystical and magical practices, in search of knowledge and conversation with each of our own holy guardian angel, that the individual will come to better know their own innermost nature, as well as, of course, the purpose of their true will in this life. Does anyone have any questions about any of that at this point? Understandable for everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, just wanted to make sure because there's some terms there which are kind of open to interpretation. Yeah. I'd like to talk now more about the order itself. Now that I've talked about the theology, um, in fact, I'd like to kind of start by talking about our church. Now, many people are scared by that word. Um, we're not Catholics necessarily, though. 
our church does have that word in its name. The Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica, or the Gnostic Catholic Church, is the ecclesiastical arm of the OTO. The chief function of the EGC is the public and private performance of our Mass, the Gnostic Mass, also known as the Eucharist. Um, the structure of this Mass is, of course, influenced by the initiatory, initiatory rites of the OTO. But not everyone present in the Mass is required to be an initiate. Um, aside from the Mass, the EGC also affiliates, uh, officiates baptisms, confirmations, last rites, and marriage. It's probably worth noting that marriage in the EGC is not necessarily reserved for couples of the opposite gender. We're very open-minded to these types of things. In fact, we take do what thou wilt very seriously. Um, the EGC basically consists of two types of members, the clergy and the laity, or the layman. The clergy, of course, are required to be initiates of the OTO. In fact, to be of certain levels within the clergy, they're also required to be of certain degrees. So, deacon, priest, bishop, etc. But there's also people who are free to be Thelemites and uh, associate with the EGC that don't have to be members of the OTO. They simply go through the baptism and confirmation rites and are welcome to attend the Mass. Even those who are not baptized and confirmed are, of course, welcome to attend the Mass. Um, though the Gnostic Mass can be performed privately by OTO initiates only, it is in no way a secret ritual, nor are any of the other rituals involved in our church. Um, the only thing we really keep secret is our initiatory rites for the degree system, for obvious reasons. So, this leads me, of course, to initiation, and what I mean by initiation. Some people may have varying opinions on what exactly that means. And so, it's not, again, an easy thing to define, but I think when it comes to, at least with how the OTO sees initiation, it's best to quote Alistair Crowley. In all systems of religion is to be found a system of initiation, which may be defined as the process by which a man comes to learn that unknown crown. Though none can communicate either the knowledge or the power to achieve this, which may be called the great work, it is yet possible for initiates to guide others. Every man must overcome his own obstacles, expose his own illusions, yet others may assist him to do both. They may enable him altogether to avoid many of the false paths, leading no whither, which tempt the wary feet of the uninitiated pilgrim. They can further ensure that he is duly tried and tested, for there are many who think themselves to be masters, who have not even begun to tread the way of service that leads thereto. Now the great work is one, the initiation is one, and the reward is one. However diverse are the symbols wherein the unutterable is clothed. Now this quote to me hints not only to the idea of self-initiation, as it also hints to the idea of the need for a community, or at least a group. I'm sure many who consider yourselves Wiccans have been self-initiated into the mysteries. I myself self-initiated into Wicca over a decade ago. Um, in fact, do what thou, what thou wilt means you can do it on your own. You don't need the help of a coven or order necessarily. It's your own journey. However, it is nice to have other people that have maybe been through the same things, or going through the same things. Um, personally, i found with my experience with the Order, um, aside from my own studies prior to being initiated into the OTO, that my knowledge of magic and meditation and Kabbalah and tarot, various other disciplines that we study, um, have increased, increased greatly compared to the 10 years prior to just in doing my own work on my own. This could be due to the fact that, you know, somebody says, oh, have you heard of this writer? Have you heard of this book? Have you looked into this? Or maybe somebody gives you their opinion on something and it makes you think, oh, yeah, you know, I didn't see it that way before. Or, you know, so it's, it's nice to associate with other people. And that's basically what the function of the OTO is. It's not a teaching order like the Golden Dawn. It is a social order. It's a Masonic order of such. 
This means that no one's going to tell you what to practice. No one's going to tell you what to believe. Uh, of course, there are suggested practices for various degrees, and there are things you'll need to know in order to progress to the next degree. But no one's ever going to force you to do so. Um, no one's ever going to expect that you go up the degrees before you're ready to go on to the next stage. In fact, there's no stigma attached to maintaining a degree for your, like staying at one degree for your entire life. Um, in fact, many are comfortable just being associates of the order, what we refer to as the Minerval degree, which is actually the zero degree, it's sort of a it's sort of a trial period. You get to you get to see what we're about, and you don't have to necessarily commit fully to the whole thing. Um, and many people stay Minervals their entire lives, and they're perfectly comfortable with that. Others want to go right to the top right away, and that's up to them. Um, I lost my spot. Of course, um, as Crowley said, none can communicate either the knowledge or the power to achieve this. This means you have to do it on your own. No one's going to do it for you. Now, people may help you along the way. They may give you their advice, suggestions on practices, books to read, what have you. No one is going to do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. And that's the bottom line. 